Hello, I'm Los Angeles City Controller Ron Galperin, and I'm so pleased to be part of the LA Public Library's continued work to promote financial literacy. All year long, the library, through its outstanding Department of Lifelong Learning, hosts life-changing programs that teach and support financial empowerment, immigrant integration and inclusion, and health and wellness. And the best part of it is that it's all free. As controller, I make sure that public dollars are being put to good use by keeping our government honest, responsive, and accountable. Because people want to know, and deserve to know, that their government is doing its best to serve them. While it's important for the city to plan how to use its money wisely, I want you to know that it's just as important for you to do the same. Because the financial health of the city depends on the financial health of all Angelinos. The programs that the library is hosting this week and throughout the year are here to help everyone succeed and to make a positive financial choice for their future. I am so grateful for all our libraries and the incredible staff and VITA and EITC financial experts and all their volunteers for all they do to ensure that you and your families have the tools and resources not only to prepare your taxes, but to help you be on the right financial track. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Galpern. Hi, everyone. I'm Carolyn Zakari, and I work in the Office of Civics and Community Services here at the Los Angeles Public Library. Welcome to Financial Literacy Month. Um, today, uh, okay, today's program is called Investing Basics, and it's brought to you by the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Los Angeles Public Library. Carol Long from the SEC will be discussing investment strategies, including information on common scams, investment fraud, and cryptocurrencies. We will have a short Q&A after the presentation, so please send us your questions throughout the program. Thank you, and take it away, Carol. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. I really appreciate it, and hopefully have some information to share that everyone will um, find helpful. I will um, make a copy of the PowerPoint available after the presentation, and as Caroline indicated, if you would just hold your questions till the end, you can put them in the chat as we go along if you like, and then I'll address them at the end. That I think that just makes it um, a lot easier for everyone, especially virtually, uh, for things to go smoothly. Um, some parts of the power present, uh, PowerPoint I may go through fairly quickly because I want to make sure that I have an opportunity to address all of your questions. So thank you very much um, again, and let's get started with the PowerPoint. So we're gonna, you know, investing basics really deals with what does securities investing mean? How do you plan for your future? And how do you protect yourself and avoid fraud? So that's really what we're gonna talk about here today. Um, I do have a uh, disclaimer that I have to give um, at the beginning of the presentation, which is essentially that everything that I discuss is not a statement of S official SEC policy. I cannot give legal or business advice. You're welcome to ask me any questions you want to ask me, um, but I may not be able to answer them if they would involve giving le uh, legal or business advice, but hopefully at the very least can point you towards some resources that will help you answer your questions. So we're going to talk today a little bit about the SEC, if you're not familiar with the agency, so you know what the agency does, and we'll talk about strategies for smart investing. And then I think what people really you know, want to focus on most of the time is understanding fraud, because unfortunately, fraud is pretty prevalent and how to protect yourself. There's the disclaimer that I mentioned. A um, little bit of background about myself. I have worked at the SEC for, at this point, getting pretty close to 20 years. Um, I'm an attorney. Uh, I've worked in the Los Angeles office the whole time. I've worked at the SEC for roughly two thirds of my career. I was an attorney in the Division of Enforcement, so I investigated and prosecuted securities fraud. Um, so I'm familiar with a lot of these fraudulent schemes that we're going to discuss today. And now in my current role, I oversee the group that conducts investor outreach like we're doing here today and also takes in the tips and complaints from the public and other federal and state agencies and helps my office decide what cases we're going to pursue and what cases might be better pursued by other agencies. So that's my role. Um, the Los Angeles office is based in downtown LA, but it covers all of Southern California, Arizona, Nevada, Hawaii, and the Pacific Islands, so a pretty large region. So that's just a little bit of 
background on me. And if you are associated with any kind of group or entity that you think might benefit from the kind of presentation that I'm giving here today, please feel free to reach out to our office. We'd love to go and talk to people, whether virtually or we're starting to go back in person. Happy to do that. We talk to all different kinds of groups all across our region. So here's a little bit about the SEC. Um, the SEC is the exclusive federal regulator of the United States securities markets, and it has a three-part mission to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and to facilitate capital formation, or basically the growth um, of business in the United States. We have the most robust uh, capital market in the history of the entire world, and so that's really a credit to all of us as uh, U.S. residents and citizens and something that the SEC takes very seriously is helping maintain uh, that robust status in the capital market, which really benefits all of us, creating jobs and wealth for all of us. We are a small to mid-sized agency, but the landscape that we oversee is really pretty large. As you can see on the screen, quite a number of different entities, um, securities investment advisors, broker dealers, public companies, um, self-regulatory organizations, so just really a, a, a fairly large landscape. Um, and the, the industry that we regulate is large, trillions of dollars um, that pass through the U.S. securities market. Almost everything that we talk about today is going to come from this website, investor.gov. There are two main SEC websites, sec.gov, which is uh, sort of more legalese and governmenty looking, um, and then investor.gov, where which is a, a public-facing website that really works to speak to the individual investor. So pretty much everything that I talk about today is going to come from that website. If we have time, I'm going to go to the website and sort of walk you through how it's set up so I can help you see some of the resources that are there um, and really very helpful, hopefully, for you. Well, let's start with a little background on strategies for smart investing. And some of this may be um, things that you have heard before, but I think it's always really helpful to kind of refresh what we may already know. And some of it may be new to you. These are strategies that are really applicable um, to anyone and just kind of the bedrock of how to make good investing decisions. So smart money management always begins with saving which is planning for emergencies or big purchases. But saving is a little different than investing. Saving involves things like an emergency fund where you want to have a certain amount of a buffer um, if some sort of unexpected event occurs and you need funds that you weren't anticipating needing. That's the point of an emergency fund or saving. Investing is different. Saving is money that you earn but you don't spend because you're saving it for those rainy days. Investing goes a step further. That's making the money grow. And usually when you're investing, you're thinking about a much more distant long-term goal, typically something like retirement. You can't just put your money under the mattress. You have to um, find a way to make to invest and hopefully make your money grow because of, as we're all becoming really unfortunately aware over the last few months, inflation. Um, you see on the screen an example of a car in 1995 that cost around $23,000. In 2020, would cost around $45,000. And as we all know, in the last few months, pretty much every consumer good and services has seen a substantial increase in price. This is why saving on its own is not enough. Investing is something that you have to um, do to really plan for the future so your money will as go, go as far tomorrow as it's going today. How does investing work? It works through compound interest. Compound interest is interest on the interest. So in other words, if you put your money in an investment uh, and it makes a certain uh, return, let's say a 4% return, that gets paid back to you, then your principal, what you originally invested, plus that interest, the extra 4%, now it's earning um, a return. And this is really, some people have called it one of the seven wonders of the world. Um, this is the beauty of investing and why it's so helpful. Uh, the graph that you see on, a, on the screen, on the screen is a $1,000 one-time investment. In red, you see that's an investment that's actually earning interest, getting the beauty of that compound interest, interest on the interest. And over the course of 40 years, that $1,000 one-time investment, even if it's not touched or added to at all, um, 
becomes $15,000, whereas the green line represents something that's just saved, you know, put in a sock drawer or under the mattress, 40 years down the line, $1,000 is still $1,000. And that's why compound interest can be so powerful and work in our favor. But an important thing to remember is that all investments have risk, um, a number of different kinds of risk, but primarily when people talk about risk, what they're thinking about is risk of loss. And that is the nature of an investment and different than putting your money in the sock drawer. Of course, it could be stolen or you know, lost, um, but it's not going to be have the potential of loss in the same way that an investment has. You can put money into a security uh, that's issued by a company. The company's business can do poorly and you can lose your investment. All investments have risk. That's the nature of investment. So it's important to understand what those risks are and what your own risk tolerance or capacity is when you make investing decisions. Generally speaking, um, the riskier the investment, the greater the potential, and the key word is potential for returns. So things that you might think of investments like CDs or cash-like investments have relatively low risk, but as a result, they pay generally lower returns, whereas something like bonds are riskier and then have the potential for higher returns, stocks being uh, the riskiest asset class, main asset class of all, um, but the potential for the highest returns. Keep in mind that the keyword is potential. Um, if somebody uses a word like guaranteed return, then that's usually a pretty big red flag of fraud. And the reason these risk, there's this risk reward correlation, if you step back and think about it, in order to induce somebody to uh, give a company its money, if the company's engaged in a risky venture, you're going to you know, probably be more hesitant to invest in something risky unless you have that potential for a higher return. So if somebody is offering a potential return that exceeds the market 18, 19, 20 percent, that's a crazy high potential return. Yeah. And they're telling you this is a safe investment right there. You know that there's a red flag of fraud because there's a disconnect in the way that investments work. Risk and potential return are correlated. A high potential return is an indication that the investment is riskier um, than the market typically uh, offers. Just generally speaking, uh, the slide on the screen now shows kind of these main three uh, categories of investments. There are other kinds of investments, but these are the three that people typically think about cash, bonds, and stocks. The way in which most people think about managing risk and really kind of a fundamental uh, prop, uh, underlying principle of investing is allocating their assets and diversifying their portfolio so that your money is spread across a number of different asset classes and uh, into a number of different kinds of investments so that if one segment of the market is performing, performing poorly, then hopefully you're invested in enough other segments of the market that are performing well, that your risks are balanced out. For individual investors, very frequently, this means investing in mutual funds or exchange traded funds. These are pools of money that are managed by uh, uh, professional money managers. And so they have the benefit of having people who have spent their life educating themselves and working in their careers, learning about money management. They are by their nature diversified. So they might hold a number of securities in a, a number of different companies, a number of different market sectors. They might have securities in construction and securities in financial companies. Usually mutual funds are pretty affordable for individual investors and they're usually pretty liquid, meaning you can buy and sell them relatively easily should you need to get out of the investment or have access to your cash. So if you think about if you're investing in a mutual fund that holds, say, 100 different stocks, if you were going to invest in those individually on your own, you'd have to spend the time doing the research, hopefully, in each individual stock before you invested. You'd have to keep tabs on them as those companies' um, business profiles change and they might not fit your investment goals anymore. And then anytime you wanted to buy or sell stock in the individual company, you would have to pay some kind of transaction fee more than likely for those individual um, purchases and sales. So it can end up really being prohibitively expensive for individual investors to diversify 
across a large segment of the market or across a number of different stocks um, where it might be, it be possible for an individual investor to afford that by investing in a mutual fund. Get those same stable of stocks um, managed by a professional with lower uh, costs for holding that investment. How do funds diversify? Well, as I said, they can. Uh, there are literally tens of thousands of mutual funds out there, um, and they can diversify in a number of ways, but generally speaking, by holding a significant number of different securities in a sector or a part of the market. So what you see on your screen is a snapshot of the stocks that are were uh, in the S&P 500 on a particular trading day. And I the, let me see if I can see it on the screen. It's very small font if it's up there, but I want to say this is sometime in 2020, a particular trading day in 2020. If you were investing in a mutual fund that tracked the S&P 500, it would hold all of these 500 stocks. So each of the words, the little acronyms that you see up there are a ticker symbol. And in the top um, left-hand corner, you can see the technology sec uh, sector with the ticker symbols for Google and Facebook and Microsoft. And then immediately below that, you can see uh, the S&P 500 stocks for the financial sector. So you see the ticker symbol for JP Morgan and Wells Fargo. These are 500 different securities that would be very hard for an individual investor to own individually, or not hard in the sense that it couldn't be done, just financially, um, there'd be a lot of costs associated with holding 500 different stocks in your account. But if you hold the mutual fund, the mutual fund has got those 500 stocks, some portion of them for you. And as you can see, some of the stocks are having a better day than others. So the stocks that are in a green box, that's an up day. Um, there, the value of the stock is going down. The stocks that are in red, that's a down day. The value of the stock is going down. So the technology sector was having a good day and the financial sector was having a less good day. But you don't have to worry so much about the financial sector having a less good day because you're not just invested in that sector. You have diversified by owning a share of the mutual fund because you're invested in all of these sectors. And hopefully the green stocks are outweighing the red stocks. And that's how you manage your risk by having this diversification. So that's how a mutual fund accomplishes that for individual investors. There are two types of mutual fund strategies, actively managed funds and index funds. An actively managed fund as the name implies and as the screen says, is actively managed by individuals who are trying to outperform a specific market index. So they might be trying to outperform the S&P 500 and get a higher rate of return than they're anticipating the S&P 500 would have. An index fund is just trying to track that performance of the S&P 500 or some other index. So it's not trying to exceed those returns. It's just trying to match those returns probably by holding the stocks that are in the S&P 500 or something comparable. There are still professionals who manage the fund, but they're not as actively engaged in buying and selling as frequently as they would be in an actively managed fund. Now, why wouldn't we all want to be in the fund that's trying to beat the S&P 500? Because more money always sounds better. Um, there are really two answers to this. One is that it's pretty hard to consistently, over time, beat uh, the market indices. They've done a lot of academic studies on this and it's actually quite difficult. But the second thing is that it is much cheaper to invest in an index fund than it is to invest in an actively managed fund. And those expenses make a difference because they eat into your return. So the actively managed fund has to not only beat the S&P 500 or whatever index it's, it's trying to beat, by enough to give you a larger return, it also has to beat it by enough to cover its higher fees and expenses. And that is really quite hard to do. Um, so it's really important if you're going to invest in a mutual fund to understand what the fees are. That is one of the questions you should attempt to answer before you invest in any mutual fund or really in any investment, what are the fees? Because all investments have fees and they definitely matter they do eat into your returns. So for example, um, the graph that you see on the screen in front of you tracks three individuals who've invested $100,000 over 20 years. They put the $100,000 into their mutual fund. Um, they have chosen 
funds that have the same um, portfolio of securities, and they've just put that money in for 20 years, and they have not touched it, they haven't taken it out, they haven't added to it, that money's just sat there for 20 years. Given that they're all investing in the same thing, getting the same return, the same amount of money, holding the same time, you would think they would end up with the same returns at the end of 20 years, but they don't um, because they have invested through different uh, companies or individuals that have charged different fees. And even though the differences in the fees seem relatively small, they make a big impact in the ultimate return that the investors see at the end of 20 years. So the individual who's paying the highest fee is represented by the green line, and they're paying a 1% annual fee, which is actually pretty low and lower than um, a lot of people in the industry charge. The person who's paying the smallest fee is represented by the blue line, and they're paying a quarter percent um, annual fee. Over the course of 20 years, as you can see on the screen, this ends up being almost a $30,000 difference in the return that they see. So almost a third of their principal um, is the difference between what they'll actually see as a return. The person paying the highest fee ends up with $180,000 at the end of 20 years, but the person paying the lowest fee ends up with $210,000. $30,000 is a lot of money. Um, so as you can see, just those small differences in the fees that you pay make a big difference in your potential return. So if you walk away with nothing else today, I hope you walk away with an understanding of this slide and what this means and how important it is to do your research on the fees that you're being charged for investing. If you're considering investing in mutual funds and you're thinking to yourself, how do I go and find the information on the different sorts of fees or other characteristics that I might be interested in? One thing you can do is go to this tool on FINRA's website. FINRA is the self-regulatory organization that oversees brokers, and then the SEC also regulates brokers and, and oversees FINRA. FINRA has this tool on its website called the Fund Analyzer, and in this database there are literally tens of thousands of um, mutual funds in the database, and you can put in the name or the ticker symbol of a couple of different mutual funds and compare them side by side. And it will give you a lot of information about the funds, including the fees. So this is a really helpful tool to use. Here are some questions you would ask. You might ask yourself um, as you're considering whether or not you want to invest in a particular mutual fund. Understand what your own goals are, what you're saving for or investing for, um, what you're hoping, uh, you know, what kind of risk tolerance you have, if this is money that you are in a position to um, take on a greater risk, risk that you'll lose the money, or if it's money that you really have a very low risk tolerance for, what's the performance over time? Again, the fees and expenses are really important. And is this going to help me diversify my investments? So for example, if you already hold stocks in a number of really large American manufacturing companies, maybe you would want to think about owning stocks in mid cap or smaller companies or foreign stocks or maybe bonds or whatever part of your portfolio you haven't rounded out yet. Is this investment going to help diversify uh, what you already have? Now let's get to the part with, um, with unfortunately some scary stories I think about what's out there but hopefully some tools that you will be able to use to help protect yourself in your own financial planning and investment experience. Unfortunately, financial fraud is really prevalent. As you can see, almost all of us um, will end up being solicited for some potentially fraudulent offer. And you probably have gotten an even better sense of that over the last two years as many of us have been at home when we would have been at the office and we, the phone rings and every day I get at least one <laughs> robocall, not always pitching a securities offering, but some kind of, you know, Somebody trying to tell you, sell you something that you probably don't want or need and maybe even potentially fraudulent. Unfortunately, what we find is that of the people solicited for potentially fraudulent offers, more than 10% respond to those offers and a pretty sizable proportion of those people who do respond end up losing some amount of money, sometimes quite a bit of money in the scam. Um, as you can see, and this fact is somewhat outdated, it's more than 10 years old, at least $50 billion a year is lost to fraud. So unfortunately, there is quite a bit of fraud out there. Um, we all have to be very mindful of that and do what we can to protect ourselves. 
there's some red flags of securities fraud. And really, I think this applies probably to a lot of things beyond just investing. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. We've all heard that saying, but it bears repeating. Um, again, if you hear things like a guaranteed return or a really high return with no risk, that's a huge red flag of fraud. People are pressuring you to invest right away. Again, a red, red flag. People who are engaged in legitimate securities investing business understand that this is a significant commitment for you to take your hard earned money and give it to them. And they understand that you want time to consider the decision. So they're not going to pressure you to act right away. Legitimate securities investing involves documentation, usually very often pretty lengthy disclosures about the business of the company and the finances of the company. And so if you're being offered an investment that has very little documentation, that again is a red flag. And if the person is not licensed or registered as a securities broker or securities investment advisor, and I'll show you how to check that, that's a big red flag too. And just to step back a little bit, I talked at the beginning about investments and things that people typically think of investments like stocks and companies whose stock is traded on the New York Stock Exchange um, or bonds. But a security has a pretty broad definition. It's really any time people pool their money into an investment, understanding that or expecting that that investment is going to attempt at least to generate profits, but they're not going to be actively involved in the business that's going to generate the profits. They're going to be passive. But the money's all pulled together into this common enterprise, and that enterprise is going to hopefully generate returns for them while they are passive. That's a security. So a security can take the form of something like an investment contract, or sometimes people call things a private placement memorandum or a prospectus. That can still be a security. So if you get offered this kind of investment, um, you still want to look for these same red flags of fraud. You still want to take the same steps that I'm about to show you to research the investment before you make a decision. Uh, even with that kind of what seems like a simpler investment, there should be documentation. People should be registered. There should not be a pressure to buy right away. And there shouldn't be these promises or almost promises of high returns with little to no risk. Unsolicited offers, I think, like the kind of robocall that I was talking about, um, are always an area in which you should proceed cautiously, if at all. The best case scenario really is not to respond um, to an unsolicited offer, whether it comes through email or text or over the phone, but rather to do your own research um, and identify for yourselves the investment that you might be interested in and you be the person who approaches um, the investment opportunity instead of the other way around. But if you do get an unsolicited investment offer um, and you do want to think about pursuing it, at the very least, you need to do the research steps that I'm going to discuss. Keep in mind um, that there are a lot of really very risky investing behaviors that we can all fall prey to. And one of those is active trading and trying to time the market or trying to pick winners. Generally speaking, what numerous academic studies have shown is that actively trading typically results in underperforming the market. Um, we all like to think that we could, or at least maybe wish we could have, timed the market um, appropriately um, and realized these great gains. I remember when I first came out of law school, I worked for a nonprofit that represented writers and Amazon got invented while I was there. And I thought this is such a great idea to sell books because right back then Amazon was only selling books over the internet. This seems like it'll be a really successful business. I did not invest in Amazon when it first came out. If I had, um, that would have been great. My life story would have been very different. Um, we'd all like to think we could be that person that could time the market to make a good investment. But actually, it's really quite hard to do, even if you think you have a good sense of where a company is going, either up or down. Individuals tend to overreact to good or bad news. They tend to jump on the bandwagon and follow trends and, and kind of miss the boat. Um, so, and you know, again, your goal is probably to be fairly diversified. Um, and so if you're focusing on individual stocks, you may be missing those opportunities to be diversified. So 
trying to time the market um, or pick only sure winners is really very difficult and quite risky behavior. We, we have seen a proliferation of this in response to social media postings in particular. So again, um, this is really very risky behavior. Um, lots of times social media posts not only um, are encouraging people to invest in things that may or may not meet their investment goals, but they're engaging in that kind of behavioral reinforcement that, um, that social media does. And often encouraging people to engage in what's fairly risky trading behavior, trading in things like margins or options or short sales, which can significantly magnify your risk. If you're just buying a stock and holding it, what you have the risk of losing of your, is your initial investment. If you're engaged in some of these other risky trading strategies like options and margin trading, you have the potential to lose more than your initial investment. And, and sometimes theoretically, potential losses are infinite. So these are really quite risky trading behaviors um, that you want to be very, very cautious about engaging in. Um, and I will say too, social media is a, are platforms in which a fair bit of, unfortunately, market manipulation type activity happens. A market manipulation uh, can happen when people spread false information about a company or at least misleading information about a company with an attempt to push up or pump up the price of the stock and get individual investors to buy in. And then in this very common type of scheme, once the individuals have bought in, the insiders who already hold shares are selling them into the market and taking the profits. And eventually it will come out that the information was false or misleading and the price of the stock will plummet and the individual investors will be left holding the bag. This happens fairly frequently in the uh, microcap uh, sector of the market or what's known as penny stocks, basically stocks that are trading at or below a dollar. Um, plenty of legitimate investments there, but also a really risky segment of the market. And if you ever saw the movie Wolf of Wall Street, that deals with the kind of pump and dump scheme um, that you will sometimes see in the microcap market. Very susceptible to manipulation through social media. So really be, be wary um, of any kind of social media campaign or postings that are touting investments in a particular company or security. Really the best tips for smarter investing are to know yourself, know what your risk tolerance is, know what your long-term objective is, and keep your eyes focused on the prize. Um, more information that you can get from more reliable sources is better. And let your decisions be guided by those goals and the objective information and not your emotions. Be very careful about acting based on what you see on social media. So now we're going to talk about some common scams, including the market manipulation that I already um, talked about. There will be a slide about that. But these are some scams that we see repeated in our region and really across the country just over and over and over again. Pump and dumps, as I described, involve the hyping of a company's stock through these misleading press releases, um, really pressuring individuals to buy quickly, and then the insiders dump their shares at the pumped up price. So when you're buying it at that elevated price, you don't know it, but you're probably buying it from an insider who got the stock probably for free and may own millions of shares um, that then even if they're selling them at a relatively low price, like two or three dollars, three times a million is a lot of money. Um, so one of the investigations that I worked on involved a pump and dump scheme run out of Seattle. And this company purported to be developing kiosks that would be displayed in airports and you'd go up to the electronic kiosk and punch in your gate and it would tell you the fastest route to your gate, what the restaurants were between you and your gate. This scheme was maybe about 10, 15 years ago. So before probably a lot of these kinds of things were already deployed in airports. And the company represented they had this great technology and lots of airports were buying it. Um, this was not true. <laughs> the company did not have this technology at all, uh, and no airports were buying anything from them. Then they put out a series of press releases that they had invested in some multi-billion dollar tranches of super secret international investments um, through prime banks, and prime bank is a specific kind of um, scam known as a prime bank scam where 
people represent that they have access to these prime bank investments that only the high rollers typically have access to if these investments do not exist. Um, but as a result of these press releases, the price of this stock, which originally was trading below a dollar, went up quite exponentially. At the same time, the company hired somebody to uh, promote their company and issue what appeared to be objective uh, investment newsletters about the company through an email campaign. So people would get a newsletter that purported to be an objective investment newsletter covering all kinds of different stocks. And one of the articles would promote this stock and say what a great investment it was. What they did not know is that individual issuing that newsletter was being paid by the company to tout the stock. That was not disclosed. If a newsletter is being paid to tout a stock, it has to disclose that um, or else it's violating the securities law. The CEO of this company had issued to himself 3 million shares of the company. He claimed that the shares were restricted and he could not trade them. And in fact, they should have been restricted, but he illegally had the restrictions removed from those shares. And so as the price of the stock went up, he was selling that into the market unbeknownst to the individuals who were buying the stock. And ultimately the share price collapsed and the individuals were left um, you know, holding essentially worthless stock. This is an example of what a pump and dump looks like. So again, there are legitimate uh, investments in this micro cap space, but unfortunately, because these companies are small um, uh, and you know very easy to form and take control of, it's also a space in which there is a lot of fraud. And even when the companies are legitimate, it's a space in which there is a lot of risk because these are small, usually startup companies with no track history, um, so, a, you know, a pretty risky investment space, even if it seems like the investment is um, something that is easy to make because the cost of the stock is relatively low. It's quite a risky investment space. The ever popular Ponzi scheme, um, which I'm sure that you've heard about, where basically the promoter is describing a business um, that sounds legitimate and people who have already invested appear to be getting returns but the returns are actually coming from the new money that new investors are paying into the company. Um, very often, these are the kinds of schemes that involve promises of high returns with little to no risk or very consistent returns. Usually, there's some kind of secret, not usually, but very frequently, there's some kind of complex investment um, strategy that um, you know, they're counting on investors not asking too many questions about. And usually there are unregistered sellers and um, brokers, dealers, or investment advisors who are promoting the investment. Ponzi schemes are very popular. Um, you know, again, not a week goes by that I don't get a tip about a potential Ponzi scheme. These very often involve, um, you know, as I say, things that are not registered with the SEC. So I'm going to show you how to check that out. Pyramid schemes, very similar to a Ponzi scheme. But usually this involves uh, a pyramid of people who are going to be acting as salespeople. You may hear expressions like the downline uh, in this kind of scheme, where the emphasis is really on recruiting other salespeople, much less than on a genuine product or service. Again, usually a promise of easy money um, and some kind of complex commission structure. Very often, these kinds of multi-level marketing um, schemes are in fact really just pyramid schemes. The SEC, as you may know, is active in the digital investment space. Um, so we do get asked questions about this fairly frequently. Um, and depending on the nature of the digital asset, the digital asset can be a security if it meets the definition that I described earlier, where people are pooling their money together in a common enterprise with the expectation of receiving profits while they are being passive. Um, so the digital asset can in fact be a security and in fact the SEC has brought enforcement actions in this area with people where people have run scams, you know, purporting to have some kind of crypto digital investment that's generate going to generate profits, but in fact people are actually running a Ponzi scheme. Ponzi scheme can take all different kinds of forms. It doesn't matter what you're investing in, real estate, digital asset, some kind of business, as long as it's being pulled together and meets that definition of a security, um, 
it, it can still be a security and it can still be a scam. Very frequently, fraudsters target members of their own group. Um, that's how they build trust. So even if you think you know the person, um, you need to make sure you check their background before you give them your money. And the groups that fraudsters target really, frankly, are everybody. So if there's any kind of segment of the population, professional group, social group that you consider yourself part of, chances are there's a fraudster out there targeting your group and that fraudster may be walking amongst you as part of that group. So how do you avoid fraud? First and foremost, you want to check out the investment professional on investor.gov. And if you'll give me just a minute, I'm going to shop, stop sharing my screen here, and then I'm going to go to investor.gov, and we can walk through this ourselves, because I think it's a little easier to see um, walking through it ourselves. So let me just stop sharing, and then let me share again. Okay, hopefully, can everybody see the investor.gov website? This is what the website looks like. Um, as you scroll down, there's a lot of information on here, which I'll show you some of it in just a minute. But right here on the landing page, right in the middle of the landing page, is check out your investment professional. You can search either individual or a firm. And if the individual is buying and selling securities on your behalf for compensation, they should be registered as a broker dealer if they're getting a commission or if they're providing investment advice for compensation, like they're managing some investments for you and you pay them an annual fee um, or some kind of fee in order to manage those investments, securities, then they should probably be registered as an investment advisor. Are they registered? Let's find out. Let's put them in this database. So I'm going to then the name Jordan Belfort. Let's say Mr. Belfort has approached me and wants me to buy um, securities in XYZ company. First thing I do before I give Mr. Belfort my money is put his name in this database. And right away I can see he has been barred by FINRA or the SEC, which is definitely something I would wanna know before I gave him my money. Click on the full report and up will come kind of a screenshot of the main information in the report. But I always go over here where it says detailed report and click on that. This report is written in such a way um, that the general, you know, to ideally make it accessible to the general public. So there will be some technical language in here, but should be fairly um, understandable. And it, in the beginning of the report, uh, very helpfully explained what's in the report and where the information came from and some of the other resources. So here we've got Mr. Belfort and we can see at the front where he's worked um, and during what period of time. We can see the securities examinations that he's passed. And if you just Google these series 24, series seven, you can get a pretty straightforward explanation of what they are. But basically, these are the broker-dealer exams that he's passed. Um, and then a little bit more information about his employers. But the really juicy stuff is at the end, disclosure of regulatory events. So these would be customer complaints, or if he's been sued by the government or by FINRA, this will end up uh, in the disclosure of regulatory events. And a great many individuals have no regulatory events. Um, a lot of entities have no regul regulatory events. If we're talking about a really huge entity, um, you know, a, a na nationwide broker dealer or investment advisor, they're going to have some regulatory events just because any kind of organization that large is likely to have them. Um, you know, but a lot of smaller entities or individuals won't have any. But if they do have them, um, obviously, you're going to want to know what they are and decide for yourself whether or not that impacts your decision to do business with this person. Mr. Belfort has three, sued by the state of Michigan, sued by the state of Maryland, um, but here's the big one, sued by the SEC back in 1994, ultimately found liable and ordered to pay disgorgement of $1.5 million, civil penalties of $500,000, um, and um, barred from working in the industry because he was operating a boiler room. He was running pump and dump schemes along the lines of what I explained before. And in fact, if you did see The Wolf of Wall Street, Mr. Belfort is the main character played by Leonardo DiCaprio in this movie. So that's obviously information that I would think you would want to have before you did business with Mr. Belfort. So hopefully everybody could see that um, on the screen. Um, and, you know, if not, 
uh, I just encourage you to go to investor.gov and check out uh, this tab for searching for your investment professional. While I'm here, let me just walk you through a little bit more of the website. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, you can see this box, Submit Questions and Complaints. So if you have a question about an investment that you've made or you um, think there's a potential that you've been targeted in a scam, you can submit that here. It automatically goes into what we call our TCR database. And right away, SEC professional staff, attorneys, accountants, paralegals, they again, looking at the complaints that come in um, and triaging them and determining whether or not uh, there's something that we need to look at more closely. All kinds of investor alerts that get issued. You can see there's one that got issued relatively recently about uh, digital assets. All kinds of financial tools and calculators. In fact, I think the most popular thing on our website is the compound interest calculator. So that's something you might want to check out that will help you do math basically on your investment. Um, and if you make a regular contribution, what your estimated interest rate is, what ultimately you might project your returns being. Um, there are resources for specific kinds of things like digital assets, resources for librarians, military and veterans, seniors, Native Americans, um, high schoolers and college students. So all kinds of different things on investor.gov. Um, as I say, I really encourage you to take a look and see what's there because everything that we talk about today is gonna to come from this website. So let me see if I can stop sharing the screen and then go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, let me see if I can make it stop doing that, hold on. I don't know if you had the flashing effect that I did. Okay, there we go. Um, well, that's how you would check out your investment professional on investor.gov. Um, same thing you want to do for the product itself. So the thing that you're investing in, the stock that you want to buy, um, the security you want to invest in, the company behind the stock, you want to make sure that security is registered with the SEC because scams very often involve unregistered companies. There are some legal exemptions from uh, registering a securities offer, offering with the SEC, but they're pretty limited. Um, so if somebody says, you know, I want, I really think you should buy stock in XYZ company, XYZ company is a great company. The very first thing you want to do is find out is XYZ company's stock registered with the SEC. And if it's not, that's a pretty big red flag that it's potential fraud. As I say, there are some legitimate exemptions, but they're pretty limited. So let me have, show you how to do that really quickly. It's pretty easy and straightforward, um, just like searching for your investment advisor. So let's see if we can stop sharing the screen and go to SEC. Okay, so here's the other SEC website I talked about, sec.gov. This is a little more um, kind of government speak website, although it has a lot of useful information about the agency itself, um, our enforcement actions and litigation releases. But you, what you want to look for if you are researching the investment itself is go to this tab, Filings. And underneath here, you can go to Edgar Search and Access. You can click on Company Filing Searches. Either one of these tabs will get you to the search screen. And just put in the name of the company. So I'm just going to put in Exxon because that's a big company that we've all heard of. And up will pop information about the company. There's First tab, company information, just some basic information about where it's incorporated and what kind of business it's in. But then under here, under selected filings, we get the really juicy information, the 10Ks and 10Qs that it's filed, um, the 8Ks, which typically correspond to press releases and kind of ongoing things that are happening at the company. These annual and quarterly reports have really detailed information about the company and so are really helpful sources of information if you want to invest in a particular company. And if you're saying to yourself, I'm not sure I know how to read these filings, we do have a really helpful section, how to research public companies right under the search screen um, that explains how to use the database and explains these different forms that are filed with the SEC and the kind of information that you might find in them. So that is how sec.gov works and how you would go about um, looking for information about a company and trying to find out whether or not the securities offering is registered. 
All right, back to the PowerPoint. The PowerPoint is just gonna walk us through what I just did. Um, so as I say, there is a helpful guide on how to research public companies. I would encourage you to go through that before you use Edgar for the first time. Other things you can do to protect yourself, make sure that anybody claiming to be from the government really is from the government. Um, you know, if you get a call from somebody claiming to be from the government, hang, I personally would hang up the phone, go to Google or my phone book. If you still have an old school phone book, find the number for the government um, agency, call them up and ask them, you know, did you try to call me? Do you have, does Mr. Smith work at your agency? Don't pay for investments with credit cards or send wires overseas. Don't speak to unknown salespeople. Um, and don't pay an upfront fee in order to claim any proceeds or winnings. This is not the way legitimate lotteries, for example, work. That is a particular scam known as an upfront fee scam or an advanced fee, fee scam. Legitimate lottery will not ask you to pay for some kind of delivery or commission or charge in advance. What happens is they send these solicitations out to literally thousands of people. If they're asking you for $20 to claim you know, $10,000, $20 doesn't sound like much, but if they can get $20 out of a thousand people, they made a fair bit of money. And what happens is people send them the $20 and then they never hear from them again. So that is a scam. Um, don't pay these upfront fees. Again, just to reiterate, the best way to protect yourself is really to be aware of these common persuasion tactics and red flags. Go on investor.gov. Look for our most recent investor alerts and be aware of some of these common investment scams and some of the scams that might be trending at any particular moment. And most of all, research, research, research. Don't um, you know, act on instinct. Don't trust social media or even people that you know um, without doing your own research. Research the person who's selling you the product. Research the people, people who are offering you investment advice and research the investment itself before making any decisions. And then last, you know, just to reiterate, everything that we've talked about today, you can get on investor.gov, um, but you can also reach out to us. We have a helpline um, that is staffed uh, in DC and all the regional offices. You can email us at help at sec.gov. Um, you can email us in the Los Angeles office, it's Los Angeles at sec.gov. And as I showed you, there's the tip complaint uh, portal on investor.gov where you can submit tips or complaints. Okay, so I'm gonna stop so that I can give us time to, um, to address any questions that you might have. Let's see if I can see. Yes. All right. Hi, Carol. Yeah, a few questions came in. Sure. Um, what kind of accounts or investments yield compounding interest? So, really um, full range of investments. And that's really the nature of an investment. You make your investment into the mutual fund or you purchase the stock or the bond and hopefully it generates a positive return. It makes money, it makes interest. And then that interest is automatically reinvested um, unless you choose to withdraw it. And so it begins the process of compounding. An, an account, I think you're talking about a bank account, like a money market account or a savings account or a checking account. Those are not securities. So that's a little bit outside of what the SEC regulates. You know, but I, just speaking personally, I mean, there are, most banks offer some kind of savings account um, that will offer an, an interest rate, maybe pretty low, like one or 2%. But as long as you don't withdraw that, if you keep that interest in the account, and keep and don't withdraw the money and let it keep building, it will compound. Um, so any kind of investment or savings account that offers interest, as long as you don't withdraw that interest, it has the potential to compound. Okay, um, one more question. Is there a difference between a securities uh, broker and investment broker? Uh, so there's, such a thing as a broker and there's such a thing as an investment advisor and sometimes people are both so a broker is someone who buys and sells stocks or bonds on your behalf in exchange for a commission just like you might pay a commission if you bought or sold a house or a car you can think about it the same way that's what a broker is an investment advisor is someone who provides ongoing investment advice and they may manage a fund 
and you may invest in that fund and that person manages the fund, decides what the fund is going to invest in, and in exchange they are paid some kind of percentage of the assets under management. That person is an investment advisor. Both of those kinds of individuals or companies have to be registered. Some people, as I say, and some companies are both investment advisors and securities brokers. And that maybe is a good point to say the relatively recent regulation that was issued by the SEC is called um, Reg BI or best interest. If you are doing business with a securities broker, they have an obligation to provide you with a disclosure form um, that explains exactly what their business is, what kind of fees they charge. This is called a form CRS. So if you are doing business with a broker and you have not received this form, you should ask your broker for that form because they are required to provide that to you. And this really, you know, gives a lot of helpful information about the broker. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we're coming up on the end. I do want to mention to everyone that this program will be is recorded and will be available on LAPL's YouTube channel soon. I think probably I would check tomorrow. And YouTube, it's going to be on there and definitely Facebook, it goes away after a week, but it will be on the YouTube channel. So you just go to Los Angeles Public Library, YouTube, and then it will be up on there in the videos. I also wanted to thank Carol once again for a wonderful presentation. I know I learned a lot. Um, and once again, Carol mentioned the website investor.gov. So if people have more questions or want to know how anything's done, just go to investor.gov. And really quickly, I just want to let you know that we have another financial literacy program coming up tomorrow. It's at 12 noon, and it's called Financial Planning 101. And Association of Financial Educators will go over just basic financial planning concepts. And coming up this month and the coming weeks, we have more financial programming, like estate planning, um, financial elder abuse. We have a savings program in Spanish and budgeting. And for more information on all of our programs, as you can see, um, our website uh, for financial literacy is lapl.org forward slash financial literacy month. So more information on there. Thank you again. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Appreciate your time.